With this, I now request uh, Lieutenant General Shukla to deliver a special address. Thank you, sir. Shri Bajan Panda, Ambassador, TSA Rathwood, Professor Mita Manchu, Mr. Rajesh Sina, Professor Shri Kam Kondapani, Dr. Manpreet Sethi, <coughs> Dr. Manish Davade, members of the faculty, SJNU students, friends, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be here at this symposium that commemorates 25 years of Pokhran II in the context of India's evolving power and purpose. A good time, in my view, for some very serious reflection on a subject of great importance. So thank you, DIF, for the invite. I do hope that I make the most of the opportunity. Let me try and lay out my understanding of India's twist with its power and purpose under various periods of its history. So I take a brief look at the fount of our civilizational wisdom. How did some of our civilizational texts and civilizations wisdom look at power, our journey post-1947, how are we placed today, and most importantly, what must we do to meet the grim challenges that line India's national security path? How must we step up our pathway and elevate our statecraft if we have to meet the China challenge, which in my view is extremely grim and serious. And uh, all of this, why must we step up our pathway and elevate our statecraft? Principally to secure what, in my view, is India's inevitable rights. There are a number of pointers to say so. I don't need to read out statistics. But many Indians and many in the world do think that this is India's moment. Our time has come. But may I warn that we must be watchful. Because from all the good that is happening, if there is one thing that could disfigure Ambedkar, it could be a major national security reversal. Wisdom demands that we do everything to guard great India's rights with thought and wisdom. So that is the central theme of my talk. Uh, since we are talking about the dynamic of power, look at our civilizational wisdom. The sheer hard-headedness of India's ancient statecraft, when it comes to that, Bad voice of Chanak. Look at what he says. He says, Yadi Shastra ko bhuloge, to apni sanskriti ko doge. Par agar Shastra ka tiyar karoge, to Rashtra ko doge. He emphasizes the importance of civilizational wisdom in the development of our worldview and our strategic outlook. He points to the salience of the instrument of force in a nation's strategic calculus. Look at the Arthur Shastra. I mean, the rediscovery of this 2 million old creatine and statecraft in 1904 in the library in Mysore helped explode a Western cliche that Indians were primarily spiritual thinkers. Of course, we were good spiritual thinkers, but we had some very fine strategic minds. The Arthashastra's conception of power, of course, includes military might, but goes well beyond it. It encompasses the use of wit and intellect, wild, guile, cunning, and even deceit, strategic cunning, so to speak. Very interestingly, the Arthur Shastra likens the concept of the state to an iceberg. The path that towers above must be a beacon of majestic power, while the one that hides in the deep must be an embodiment of secrecy, duplicity, manipulation, and constant surveillance. Now I know that this is not something that could be taken as it is and applied modern times, it must be repurposed intelligently, applied to the strategic context. But this is what the Arthashastra says. Look at the incisiveness of Guru Tegh Bahadur when he says, Bal hoe, bandhan chute, sab kuch lage upai. So when strength accrues, shackles snap, every move seems a strategy. Now of course, this power that he talks about, uh, or what he's actually saying is that power has a logic and dynamic of its own. It enables, you, it enables you to strategize ahead of others. You set the tone and the pace, others follow. You act, others react. They constantly wonder why you do this and why you do that. If suddenly China has become, you know, the subject of great commentary and wonderment, it is because of the sheer change in the balance of power. So I am making this this argument, and this is not power to jackboot around the region or the world. It 
It is a good power that inspires respect. Calibrated power that enables persuasion and radiates influence. So thoughtful, wise exercise of power. Now, of course, the India that we want must be powerful all right, but it has to be responsible and restrained. To, re uh, to paraphrase John F. Kennedy from another context, perhaps in India that matches its military strength with its moral restraint, its wealth with its wisdom, and its power with its purpose. Might I also draw your attention to another facet of our civilizational wisdom practices, that which advocated the smart convergence of Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Durga, so institutions of learning, centers of wealth creation, and instruments of power. Our texts advocate the smart convergence of these instruments to grow the nation's strategic poise. So you read, write, research, publish, and patent, leverage the goddess of learning, uh, so to speak, to create wealth, and use Lakshmi so created to nurse your instruments of power. So uh, this thought uh, enables the intermingling cross flows of talents and attributes from across the domains. And why I make this point is because I'll return to it later in the context of our challenges. So academia, R&D, DRDO, IITs, startups, <laughs> of uh, business, the corporate world, instruments of force, all coming together in the resolute pursuit of the Indian national interest and the aggregation of a unique brand of Indian power. Now what is this? This is nothing but civil military fusion, which by the way is the buzzword today in China, in USA and Israel. China, we of course know right, how smartly it has calibrated the military and civil instruments there to take its part to the <coughs> Let me just quote to you President Z. So President Z says that the contest between superpowers is primarily a contest for talent. Without talent, your strategic military enterprise is like a tree with no roots, a fountain with no water. And then they go on to practice thousand challenge plans whose stated objective is to recruit geniuses from all over the world. And they don't stop it at that. In, you know, a, a connect between the CCP and the PLA, you have Nobel laureates like Dr. Frank Ching Ning Yang, Nobel laureates in physics. Uh, Dr. Andrew Yang, expert in code making, code breaking, winner of the A. Turing Medal. A. Turing was the father of artificial intelligence. They are probably in the strategic military projects of the PLA. Now, why I make this point, and this is also a point of one and a half years back, I went to the US. The US, driven by China, has created a Futures Command, which is located in Austin, Texas. So it intermingles on a day-to-day -day basis with Carnegie Mellon and Austin, Texas. And they are powering innovation through the armed forces. They are powering similar examples in the United States, 200, 382 in Israel, taking the smartest minds to power space, cyber, EW in Israel. So investing, getting everybody together in person to the national interest, and this is what is called civil military fusion. And what our civil and our civilization takes to me appear it propagated the same thing. Now, uh, you know, there are various lenses through which you could view power. Mr. Panda referred to some, I'm sure the other speakers will. But when it comes to hard power, this is one of the ways you could look at uh, power, especially in the context of the China challenge, which I will, uh, which I will, which I, which I will come to. You, the point that I wish to make is that if you believe in the realist version of power, you could of course turn to Kissinger, Morgan Pugh, and John John Maishaima. You could also benefit from our civilizational wisdom, which is perhaps richer and far more clairvoyant and nuanced. Uh, and you know, if we do this, we could build this India, which is which rides on economic privacy, technological progress, and strategic military poise. And the smart fusion of all talents and domains, no divisions between civil and military, government and private, and you develop a strain of entrepreneurial thought that powers your strategic military poise. But what happened post-independence, and this is a point that I wish to also you know, put up for discussion, that in the immediate aftermath of 1947, for various reasons, and some I would admit were valid, the infancy of our democracy, the fragile state of our economy, 
uh, the myriad social challenges, the fact that we were still you know, navigating very difficult waters in the international arena, the Indian state developed somewhat of an ambiguous relationship towards our economy. It was bashful in court. Look at the signals given to Durga and Lashti by Prime Minister Nehru. And I'm not making a political point, please. Prime Minister Nehru, I would be the first to acknowledge, had, was a great statesman, he was an institutional builder of, 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 of a very different time. But look at the messages that he sent to the, sent to the instruments of power and resignation. So Farid Zakaria tells us in the postmodern world that some six months into government, Prime Minister Nehru steps into the Ministry of Defense and finds uniformed officers in the Ministry of Defense and flies into a ridge. Now Farid wonders, having been brought up in American universities, as to if American Indian military officers are not seen in the Ministry of Defense, where else would they be seen? But that was the reality of the times. We also know later of his conversation with Mr. J. R. D. Tata, whom he was very whom he was very fond of. And then Mr. Tata talks about, you know, I think Air India or somebody making profit. He says, J. R. D. don't utter that dirty word. And indicates to him that he should leave the room. Now, if these were the signals that you sent to the instruments of power and wealth creation, there would be natural consequences. And in my experience, let me just point out to two in the national security domain. So in the MOD and in the army where I grew up, there were these wasteful debates, petty quibbling, some of which Professor Matthew was witness to when he chaired one session and I spoke on civil relationship about the status of the defense secretary and the service chiefs who were senior, senior, this and that, you know, petty arguments about status, while the world was moving towards strategic productivity and strategic outcomes. And the second major consequence was the dissolution of the Indian power enterprise into these fractured, unproductive silos, civil and military, government and private. This gave birth to monopolies in defense, like HAR and DRDO, which are strictly unproductive, and we are now trying to reform 60 years down the line. The private sector was, of course, terrible. The energy of the startup system had not yet come. There was a web of regulations and processes. Net and these processes were never audited at the lowest level outcomes in delivery. In consequence, therefore, what happened in my view, and of course, let me point out that there were many high points despite all this the spectacular victory of 1971, Pokhran 1974, 1998, successes in our missile program, 1967, Natura, so on and so forth. But in some, in some, in my view, we did, we did in consequence, seem to punch below our strategic weight. Our embrace of powerhood was halting and hesitant. And in many metrics of national security, we trailed global best practices. Now, that was the very serious consequence. Now, many of these cues in our civil military relationship, in our national security posture, were corrected progressively. Pokhran II and the operationalization of the Indian nuclear deterrent was one such benchmark. Dr. Sethi perhaps will dwell on it later. But in the stated way that was, and this is my honest, dispassionate view, some of the steps taken by the Narendra Modi government in recent times are indeed path-breaking and prospective game changers. And I would really like that in, in the universities like this, the import of these steps are discussed in detail, because they signal a new strategic intent, a renewed power and purpose. And what are these steps? Establishment of CDS DMA. Some of you spent 43 years in the military and saw how things operated. Let me tell you that they are of unique significance, transformative. If you go into the details, the CDS DMA establishment is more powerful than America's, America's bank gold water records. It has returned to the military its legitimate voice, its legitimate voice in strategic policy making, of course, under very firm civilian control. It in fact challenges the military even further. And here the military needs to introspect. Is it delivering on what it is restored with? It, the, the challenge is to drive comprehensive change to the national security system. I paraphrase our Prime Minister who has said, speaking to the combined commanders, that we have many men of valor, many, you know, many traditions of gallantry. We need thought leaders now who can drive change to the national security system. And we are finding that it's very challenging. Uh, the second would be these new normals in our strategic outlook. So we could quibble with the strategic strides, Barakot, Tehra, Shyamsi, but let me tell you, 
that they do signal new abnormal in our strategic outlook, and the adversary knows it. It has also led to a more central positioning of the instrumental force in our strategic calculus that China has spoke of. The operational rebalancing to the northern borders. I mean, all that has happened, I would not like to go into detail, but I would just say this, that it has narrowed China's options considerably. Yangtze may well have signaled to China the end of this salami slice. It is getting unproductive. So there is a new resolve in our external orientation and our military poise. Our military defense is much more than technological self-reliance. We want technological self-reliance was our was a, a credo right since 1947. In my view, it is a thoughtful, ambitious venture which exhausts the Indian state and its entrepreneurial class to tap into its deep resources of innovation, creativity, and enterprise to take our national security voice to the next level. Liberate them once again, as our Prime Minister says, from the scourge of process and procedure. He says, it's a name of a jal which had a kaya spot. And as we see that, and I read very closely to the startup, that new energy is coming into defense. Because today, the private sector is not only playing a role in capacity building, but in war fighting. You look at Ukraine, what Elon Musk our internals have done, what Peter Thiel's calendar algorithm has done, how it has revolutionized intelligence, battlefield management and targeting, what Microsoft teams have done and such. So private sector, you know, in a big way. Just look at Elon Musk, when we were growing up, rockets were country things done by a few countries. He has made a country thing a company thing. The partner of the US space comp today is not NASA, it is Elon Musk. Now, if Atmanir Bhatta takes off in this fashion, see how it, how it will empower the Indian, you know, with that military in, in, in industrial uh, 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 complex. So, it is actually the attempt is to change it into an ecosystem that thrives on competition. So, Tata Airbus to challenge the monopoly of HA. This is if these internal collectives action, that's why it's so different. And the last point I would like to bring to your notice. You know, defense coming out of the shadows of foreign policy. I very curiously have heard the Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, refer to this in many of his speeches. That, you know, defense ka aage apna vajud hai. It has an independent character that complements our foreign policy. Because as noted American diplomat George Schultz never failed to remind us, negotiations are but an euphemism for capitulation unless the shadow of power is cast across the body of the Therefore, all the initiatives that you see, DTTI, 2 plus 2, Quad, ISET, they have very substantive military components which need to be nurtured so that they deliver and the Indian, you know, strategic, and I'm not making an argument for the military. It is the largest strategic military enterprise that is taken to a new level. Now, with that, I come to the final point that I wish to make. The reforms that I alluded to have given India's national security frame a robust springboard. But a springboard for a larger, comprehensive national security makeover. And I need to my words carefully. We still need to make multiple transitions in pace and scale if we are to successfully grapple with the challenge that is before us, and that is China. Just let me point two to three aspects of the China challenge. Why it should not worry us, but it should concern us. Look at Z. I quote President Xi, he says, and this is rare from a political leader, as important as economic prosperity is, it is military power that ultimately lies at the heart of state power. So you are dealing with a very different customer. Xi once again at the 20th Party Congress in 2022, our country has entered a period of development in which strategic opportunities, risks, and challenges are concurrent. We must therefore be more mindful of potential dangers and be ready to withstand, and this is typical Chinese phraseology, high winds, choppy waters, and even dangerous storms. PLA is indeed preparing for dangerous storms. It is, you know, modernizing at speed and at mind-boggling scale. Just let me give you three pointers. There is a Hoover Institution study which says that the PLA has grown since 1990 42 times, now, not in, as a linear growth, but in various military metrics. They have you know, a very complicated paper which tells you the aggregate growth is 42 times. PLA's defense budget over the last three decades has grown 800%. And 
And what is extremely strange is that the PLA has been mentored and curated personally by SQDC. I have not seen a head of state in recent times who spends three days with their infantry school, four days with their artillery academy, another six days with their aviation academy, so on and so forth. So therefore, you know, uh, the point that I wish to make is that the PLA, you see, in many ways it could be a parade ground bed. It could be social media fluff. But it is attempting a very major transformation. In the words of Martin Jeffress, the most massive military modernization in the history of mankind. In the history of mankind. And therefore we need, we need, we need to be here. And what is worse, you know, pioneer to this thousand challenge plan that I spoke of earlier, what should also worry us is what the party ideologues are saying. They are saying enough of wealth. It is time now to convert that wealth into power. So they are you jettison Hyde and Bile. And by the way, Hyde and Bile was hardly peaceful rights. You read Michael Pillsbury, it was the most a, a brilliant charade of self-deception. There is a Chinese saying, you know, that to cross the oceans receive the heavens. And they actually did that. And the same 36 pathogens, one sub subtext of it is that your deception should be so carefully orchestrated that by the time your adversary realizes it, it's too late. Look at America today. The CNC tape bombs, successive military commanders are able that it is difficult to penetrate the first iron chain. The mighty America says that if in the first 24 hours of the Taiwan contingency, against the rocket force, they will lose 90% of their aircraft on ground. Now, and therefore, uh, these are, these are the, the, the huge challenge. They say Mao gave us the revolution, Deng gave us wealth, Z will restore us to our greatness. Taiwan is of course an overly priority in this restoration of greatness, but there are other sacred obligations as well. They are not referred to, but the references are obvious. I, and you know, just this, in 44 critical technologies today, China is ahead in 37. The USA leads in a mere seven. And this is a study from an Australian policy institute. In terms of, say, economics, a few percent, percentage points here and there, many estimates say that by 2035, 24% of the global GDP will come from China. And from USA, it will be nearly 14%. So people like us, when we grow up in this you know, era of American unipolarity, these statistics are stunning. And I can rattle off a whole you know, in terms of free trade, uh, economics, and so on and so forth. But the real point is this, you know, that uh, from all indications, China is a superpower as a major power has arrived. Much of what Dr. Panda says could go wrong. I mean, one cannot rule out anything. But from very major of, uh, indications, uh, so this superpower has arrived, or very nearly so. Strategic competition between China and India is likely to intensify. It will most likely get violent. A kinetic manifestation cannot be ruled out. And by the way, Z tells his PLA that we will fight, but only when we are 1,000 percent sure. So he's emphasizing on readiness, you know, and all, 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 all this uh, kind of stuff. So what must we do? You know, there are many things that we could do. There's civil military fusion that I spoke of. I don't have no time to go into the details of all this civil military fusion. But one thing that we need is a major reimagination in our strategic outlook. And once again, universities like these can debate this. We need to step up our ambitions significantly. Take them beyond the LSD and the LC. That we manage. But it will be larger domains that you know there, there, there is value. Also, please consider this. The character of a military, of a strategic military enterprise, is much more than the military. Military, DRDO, this whole business of our military defense, so on and so forth. Designed to secure a $3 trillion economy has to change significantly if we are to secure a 35 to $40 trillion economy, which we might be in 2047. And that change must begin now. Because, see, to say joint, technologically enabled, is very easy. Ready instrument of force. See how important readiness is. China, the world's second most powerful military, fifth largest army. See how they unravel when it comes to readiness. Jointness, India may have 9,000 So all this is going to take uh, and a lot of persuasion from
from retirement corridors like this. Uh, in USA, much of the strategic military change has been brought about by think tanks. Respectfully, in my view, in Delhi, the think tanks are relatively dead. These debates don't seem to come up. One reason why USA might still take the lead is because they have opened up. Every week there's a book on China. Every week there's a paper on China. We, while we are tending to the threat from China, I don't think the strategic debate wing is deep enough. And that is my whole point that the springboard has been set up, but we need to make this larger national security. Uh, you know, structural pressures like data commands are all right, but we need cultural transformation, civil military, new talent pipelines. Look at the way other militaries are going, these new domains of space, cyber, AI, robotics, so on and so forth, they're not be powered by the same minds. We need an entirely new talent, uh, you know, talent pipelines of the best and the brightest. There are many uh, new uh, uh, pathways for career mobility, bringing in the private sector. I just point to two military metrics which should tell you why things are so wide, why so. Look at this ecosystem of long-range precision, which the Chinese have built over the last 40 years. Last 40 years. And what is the response to the China's rock to China's rocket force in the East China Sea and South China Sea? The mighty Americans are saying, as I said, that 90% of their aircraft will be taken off the ground. So they are looking how to fight dispersed and distributed. The mighty Americans. This is what we need to do. And of course, develop a response in terms of ranges, tonnages, we've done something. But those are just baby steps. Similarly, see, just look at this, uh, look at Ukraine. Of course, we have the same, you know, blood and gore of combat, but it is riding a very strong technological backbone. To quote General Mark Milley, data is the new engine of war. And this is just not theory now. In Ukraine, data, algorithms, Miniaturization of computing power and this whole transition to digital combat is being done by both the militaries. China is pretty ahead of this. We have to you know, make this transition to look, uh, military industrial capacities. Look at this today, I'm putting the US Under Secretary for Research. If from an operational idea, idea to operationalization in the inventory, China can take seven years. That China takes seven years. And what does the USA take? 17. And what does India take? I won't even hazard a guess. Now, this is the nature of strategic military competition, which goes far beyond the LAC and the LAC. Similarly, you know, there is so much that you can that needs to be done in the domain of space and all. So I will end now with just one thought. You see, when we make arguments for all this, the first argument comes to where do we find the budgets? Now, firstly, it is not about budget, it is about asymmetric balance. I just need a quick, uh, let me quickly explain this. So, the American defense budget is about $885 billion. China's defense budget is $225 billion. Ours is about $85 billion. That military differential is 3 is to 1 in all cases. Trust me. Why is it that Beijing is causing displacement anxiety in Washington and we do not cause similar displacement anxiety in Beijing? Because of our refusal to make all other corrections. We have to command many managers, many times, many times. Now, we must seriously prospect. And of course, it costs, but deterrence, I would say, is of course costly. But see, Ukraine, war is costly. War is costly. And it is not only this, it is this disposition of democracies never to go whole hog and take just incremental steps. Look at November, December, you've seen that. Momentum was back with Ukraine, and then all of those promises came from the West, and very little has materialized. Poland promised 14 tanks as suddenly there were nine, and so on and so forth. So, very soon, take it from me, operational momentum will get restored to the, uh, to the Russians. For all of these reasons, despite all, I would say uh, the Supreme Court that has been provided is very welcome. A lot more needs to be done in terms of a comprehensive national security makeover. With those words, I rest my case. Thank you.